you ever spent time with someone who was waiting, wanting to die? If you haven't, you will. It's inevitable. I'm not referring to those who are in a deep depression, who are deeply discouraged and just want to go to sleep and not wake up. Because at least often that's a somewhat temporary condition. A condition from which there will be release. I'm not even talking about those for whom death is imminent. Those who know that they're in their last few hours or their last few days and that there's no turnaround. Because even there, the dynamics are different. I'm referring to those people who live in a, in a certain yet uncertain interim. For them, life is in the rearview mirror. They know that their days of really living and experiencing life and enjoying life is in the past. They know they don't have a future that way. And eternity, heaven, being with God is, is out there, but they can't grasp it. They're not there yet. They can't reach it. So there aren't any delusions about going back to life as it once was. And there's this longing to go home, to be with God. Now sometimes that condition is a result of a debilitating injury or an illness. Heart attack, cancer. A condition where a person knows there isn't going to be a turnaround. The things are not going to get better. And they reach the point where there's just no fight left. No cure is coming. Nothing's going to change it. And they reach the point of saying, let's just let it be over. Sometimes it's due to the death of a dear family member. I've experienced this many times with an elderly person whose spouse has just died. They don't want to go on alone. They don't want to face the future by themselves. And so their prayer and sometimes their, their spoken word is, I just want to die too. I just want to go and be with God and my loved one. And sometimes it's simply due to old age. I've encountered that, visiting people in a nursing home, for example. I'm no use to anyone anymore. I'm just a burden. My family doesn't need to bother me being around. Why am I still here? Why won't God take me home? It's not something we want to hear, but it's something that's real and honest for the people who are expressing it. So how do you respond when someone you care about is feeling this way? You listen to their pain without taking it personally. It seems as though they're rejecting you when they're saying, I don't want to be here anymore. We take that very personally. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting life in general. You may say, but I still need you, and they know deep inside that you'll get along fine without them. They, they aren't necessary anymore. Nobody's indispensable, and they've come to understand that. <clears throat> what I've tried to do with people who are elderly and, and living with that kind of an attitude is gently remind them that if they're still here, they still have a purpose. They don't want to hear it. They say, I can't do anything, I can't go anywhere. I'm of no good to anybody anymore. But you can still pray. You can pray for me. You can pray for the church. You can still be an encouragement to somebody else who's a resident in that nursing home as well. You can still model for all of us a patient trust in God. Even though you don't feel like you want to trust Him anymore. That you don't want to be patient. You can choose to do that. You can still be still and know that God is God. You can still work on your relationship. If you're still here, God is still in relationship with you, and you can still grow in that no matter what. But there's one other thing we can do that I think we often fail to do. We can reassure them that Jesus understands. Because 
he was in a similar position. So many people in that condition don't think God understands at all. They don't think that Christ can relate to them. But if we look at the humanity of Jesus, we understand that he does. A little bit of background before I read the appropriate scripture. The events of Thursday night and early Friday morning that we commemorate in these hours are, are a bit murky. We know that Jesus was arrested by the Jewish authorities. It wasn't the Roman soldiers who came after him. It was his own people. Betrayed by one of his disciples with a kiss. Arrested by the temple guard of the Jews by his own people. We know that sometime during the night and the early morning, he faced trials before both Caiaphas and Pilate. Caiaphas was the high priest. He was the one who would have pre pre presided over the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of the Jews. They were the ones who would reach a decision whether Jesus was guilty or innocent, whether he deserved death or not. But they didn't have the right to execute anyone. So he had to go before Pilate, who was the governor of Judea at that time. Only Pilate, with the power of Rome behind him, could give the order of execution. So sometime during those dark hours and early on Friday morning, there's these trials that are occurring. They didn't take place in the same place, and so there was travel in between. Jesus would have been chained to guards around him and taken from one trial to another moved about Jerusalem during the darkness, facing trials that were illegal because they were in the darkness. And certainly a part of that night, Jesus would have been held in a dungeon. That's the holding tank for prisoners at that day. That's where he would have been probably with the other criminals who were to be crucified with him the next day, assuming that they had been sentenced as well at that point. When we were in Israel, we had the privilege of standing in the dungeon in Caiaphas' house. Those steps that you see on the screen are the steps going back to Jesus' day. Steps he himself would have walked up. They're cordoned off and can't, couldn't walk up them, but we can take pictures of them. And they led to Caiaphas' house, and in the basement of that house was a dark, cold, dreary dungeon. Just standing there, and it was daylight, so at least some light was filtering in there. This, this sense of claustrophobia, it's just kind of closed in on you. You try to imagine what it would have been like to be there in the total pitch black hours of the early morning. It was here that we read Psalm 88. Using that psalm because many biblical scholars believe that those are the words that Christ would have recited to himself. Certainly as a good Jewish boy, he had grown up memorizing scripture. He would have known the psalms by heart. He would have shared those. And to get through the night, he may very well have recited these words. And so as I read this psalm to you, listen to it from that perspective. Listen to it from the perspective of Jesus in the total darkness of that dungeon, saying this to himself, O Lord, the God who saves me, day and night I cry out before you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of trouble. My life draws near the grave. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like a man without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I have been fined and I cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, O Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do those who are dead rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness? 
or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion. But I cry to you for help, O Lord. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, O Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I have been afflicted and close to death. I have suffered your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken my companions and loved ones from me. The darkness is my closest friend. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the words of our God abide forever. There are so many emotions expressed in that psalm that would have been real to Jesus and real to people today. Let me paraphrase some of those and walk through the parallels. I keep praying, but is anybody listening? We know that Jesus wrestled with this on the cross. My God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you? What are you doing? Why did you turn your back on me? We've had this perfect relationship from the beginning of eternity, and now when I need you most, you're not there. Anybody listening? There are so many people in this later stages of life, in this interim period between fully alive and, and death, that really wonder if God still cares to listen. And so I challenge people to pray, and what comes back is, why? I don't think God hears me anymore. He's not answering my prayers. He's not listening to me. Where is he? He's forgotten me. He's involved with younger people who are still doing things for him. I can't do anything anymore. He's turned his back on me. I'm dying. And everybody knows it, even if they won't talk about it. The psalmist here feels so very isolated from God and from others. Listen to some of these phrases. Set apart with the dead. Those that you remember no more. Cut off from your care. He's feeling so isolated. And Jesus certainly experienced that isolation. His disciples have deserted him. There's nobody there trying to defend him. Nobody stands with him while he's on trial. And now he's in this dark dungeon, and in the darkness, the sense of being isolated and being alone would have overwhelmed him. People who know that they're dying, can feel that nobody understands. And in a sense, they're right. If we haven't been in that position, we don't fully understand. They feel like a burden to those who they think are waiting for them to die. They say such things as, everybody would just be better off if I was gone. They, they're waiting to get on with their life, but they can't move forward until something happens to me. Their physical and emotional and their spiritual strength often is gone. There's no fight left. They hurt. They're in pain. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, they're, they're weak. They have no purpose left. They have no reason to keep on fighting. And they feel so alone. And, and all too often, families don't openly talk about it. Sometimes it's the person dying who doesn't want to talk about it. Sometimes the families in denial and they don't want to talk about it. And so they feel cut off from integrity in their relationships. They fear that before long, no one will even remember them. Sometimes they say it often to thinking, who's going to remember me? For how long? Soon everybody will be on with their living again. And they'll get involved in their activities and their relationships and they won't think about me. Did my life even matter? And often they wonder what they did wrong that God is punishing them by having them go through this experience. They ask, why me? Why am I going through this? What did I do to deserve this? What's this all about? Another sense of the psalmist. He 
saying, someone locked me in this wretched body and they threw away the, the keys. He has clarity over the fact that there's no escape from him for him other than death itself. He says, I'm confined and I cannot escape. I'm locked in here. Isn't there any delusions that some miracle is going to rescue him? Jesus would have experienced that that night. He knows deep inside there isn't going to be any angelic army coming to his rescue. It's not going to happen. He knows the purpose for which he was born. And it was to experience this. There's this tremendous sense of isolation that he has from others around him. Even though there may have been other prisoners in that dungeon with him, he's so very much alone with his thoughts, with his emotions. And it's incredibly lonely. Could Jesus have also asked these questions of the psalmist? What really happens on Sunday? Is there a reason for hope and confidence in God? Or does the relationship with God also end? Is God's love declared in the grave? Is there a sense of faithfulness that gets to be experienced once or again? <coughs> People ask questions. What will it be like? Will I have memory? Will there be relationships? Will I know people? Will I be able to see what's going on here on earth? And we wonder the same thing. We have so many questions and so few answers. I think what we often miss is that the human Jesus would have wrestled with some of those same questions. It's so easy for us to look at this night and see him as the eternal son of God. And he was fully God. But scripture clearly teaches that he also was fully human. And as a fully alive human, knowing he's about to die, he would have had some of these same questions that the psalmist has, that we have. He would have wondered. He didn't fully know. One more. Why does this last so long? When will it be over? And then what? What's next? Jesus has a sense of what's ahead for him. That's why he prayed in the garden, Father, if there's any other way, let me escape this. I'm not sure I can do it. But the human side of him didn't fully comprehend the suffering that's ahead. And for Christ, it's going to get a whole lot worse first. The torture is still ahead. The pain, the agony, the suffering, the crucifixion, the being abandoned by his Father as he suffered the punishment of our sins. It's going to get worse. But then it's going to get incredibly good. And that's what we hold on to. And that's what we hold out before those that we care about. We listen. We try to empathize with their pain. We're honest enough to admit that we don't fully understand what they're going through. We know that it hurts when they seem to detach from this life and detach from us as they go through this period. I've said it many times. I don't fear death. But I sure don't look forward to dying. Because it's that process of dying that can be incredibly fearful and frightening. That can be incredibly painful. I've been with people when they've died very, very peacefully. And I've been with people when they've died very, very painfully. Those are realities. But what this night teaches us is that the story doesn't end. We experience this and we come
come to understand that when we, in our human condition, go through this, either with loved ones or by ourselves, when we're struggling with this, and all of us, at some point, will be in this condition, unless we're killed instantly. But for many of us, we'll go through a lot of these emotions. The psalmist wasn't alone. There's two things we need to remember. And I'm not naive enough to think that when you reach that point, you'll remember a sermon that I did on Good Friday. <laughs> but I am trusting enough that the seeds that God's Spirit plants in our hearts will take root and will bear fruit when we need them. There's two things that I want to understand and I hope you understand when that moment comes. One is that we're not alone. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, has gone through this process ahead of us. The Jesus who was fully human felt these emotions and asked these questions and had these doubts. There's not sin in that. There's humanity in that. So remember you're not alone. And second, remember this is not the end. There's the third thing to remember. We don't have to do it in our own strength. That's why we come to this table tonight. That's why every time we celebrate this sacrament, it's not just an exercise in going through some religious ritual. It's a reality of asking and trusting that Jesus Christ himself comes to us. This is a reminder of what Jesus has done on our behalf. The sacrifice he has made so that we can live in his strength. It is a reminder of the rest of the story. That we get to experience eternity with him. And it's a reminder that he is here. And this bread and this grape juice tonight. And when he says, this is my body. This is my body broken for you. Take this remembering me. He's saying I'm here with you. This is my presence for you. Right here, right now in a tangible way. Reminding you that I am with you always. Even when you go through the incredible process of dying. This cup is the new covenant made possible through the shedding of my blood. This cup is a reminder that your sins are forgiven. That while you will die physically, you will not die spiritually. That you will not face the punishment of your sins because I have already taken that on myself on the cross. And I have released you and set you free forever. Let's give it thanks. Father, I pray tonight for those hospital beds, nursing homes, hospice centers, and their own home. Those who are waiting and wanting to die, but can't. It's a tough inner. It's a lonely place to be. But in a very real sense, you can understand. In a very short period of time, you experience so many of the emotions that they experience. You're related with the writer of Psalm 88. And you relate today with those in that situation. And Lord, someday, most of us will be there too. Thanks that we don't have to go through this on our own. Thanks that you will come to us, even if we're no longer able to take the sacrament. You will come to us by your spirit. You will feed us and strengthen us. And you will walk through 
that valley with us. But Lord, we don't think we're there yet. And so we ask you to come to us tonight. And strengthen us for the journey of faith and strengthen us so that we can be more sensitive to those who struggle in these ways. Holy Spirit, you know our hearts. You know our lives. You know what we need from you tonight. We ask it not because we deserve it. We know we don't. But we ask it because of Christ. We receive the gift that he offers. Even as we pray, as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be. 